But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Roger, Eagle, Ben, Doc. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle, Eagle has wings. Roger. The Eagle has wings. On its own now, but with Columbia near at hand, it coasted around to the backside of the moon, and there, while out of direct communication with the Earth, it fired its engine to slow its descent to a touchdown on the near side of the moon. Collins in Columbia continued in orbit, awaiting their return. Contact light, engine arm on. We're home. <laughs> Man on the moon. Houston, uh... Oh, jeez. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Ooh. Oh, boy. Thank you. Mm. Boy. <laughs> okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. There's a foot coming down. There he is. Yeah. There's a foot coming down the steps. Armstrong is on the move. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. Yeah, now step off the limb. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful. Uh, Neil and Buzz. Uh, the President of the United States is in his office now and would like to say a few words to you, over. Uh, go ahead, Mr. President. This is Houston out. Hello, Neil and Buzz. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. Thank you, Mr. President. The first tourist on the moon. bachelor's degree, get your master's, or get your PhD, but most of all, get your horns up. What starts here changes the world. Hello, my name is Ben Iverson, and I'm the Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies. And 50 years ago, when I was nine years old, my mother called me in the house, I was outside playing with my friends, and she said, you gotta watch this. And I saw what you saw. I saw Texas ex Walter Cronkite declare we were on the moon. I saw Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin skipping around the moon. The entire world held its collective breath and shared in the achievement. It was not merely an American on the moon. It was a human being, and the entire world shared in that moment. Later that night, I went outside, and I think I did what a lot of people did. I stared up the moon. And I knew at that moment there were humans on that moon. And in that moment, the impossible is possible. It's very clearly, vividly in my mind that that was the moment I decided I wanted to be a scientist. Now, I can't guarantee that we're going to be able to capture that tonight, even a little of it. But I hope that in some way, with the program you're going to see, we can inspire you and realize that, yes, 
the impossible is possible. So we're going to hear from three fantastic faculty members. The first is Wally Fowler. Since his middle name is Thomas, he's affectionately known as WTF. <laughs> he's a distinguished teaching professor emeritus in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics in the Cockrell School of Engineering. Hold on. The Cockrell School of Engineering. <laughs> Just checking. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess my mic is on. I want to talk about Apollo 1969, what sticks in my mind. Uh, let's see. First off, pre-Apollo, we didn't know much about the moon. The theory was that you would land on the moon, sink 50 feet into dust like quicksand, and die. Dr. Byron Tapley, the first uh, professor that, in the aerospace department that was doing space, was my supervising professor, and I was here at UT. I have three degrees from UT. Cut me, I bleed orange. Uh, but anyway, Dr. Tabby had this project from General Dynamics, and what they wanted to do was to fly to the moon and answer the question, is there 50 feet of dust? The idea was to go to the moon, orbit the moon with an orbiter, fly down with a missile from the orbiter. The orbiter has cameras. Take a picture as this missile hits there and explodes, and look at the crater. They didn't do that. They, the General Dynamics didn't get the contract, but basically, I was, I was lucky enough to do the first, that was the first orbital stuff I had ever done in my life, so I was lucky enough to get to do that. What they did do, they did do Ranger, and Ranger was a situation where we sent missiles to the moon, and they would take pictures, take pictures, take pictures, take pictures, crash and you'd get a half a picture. The, the last second, they would come about 8,000 feet over a mile in that last second, and they would crash there. They did answer the question in Surveyor in 1966. They did answer the question, and we'll see more about Surveyor a little bit later on when I talk, in the talk. I want to talk today about Apollo, and I want to talk about two people. I want to talk about Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, and I want to talk about Alan Bean. Why would I talk about Alan Bean? The first and only Longhorn on the moon. That ought to be important to you. Clap. Come on, clap. Okay. First off, Neil Armstrong. We all know the name. Why did NASA pick Neil Armstrong to be the commander for the first lunar flight? Well, it goes back to something that happened to Jimmy 8, something that happened with the lunar landing research vehicle, and then, uh, then Apollo 11, he was chosen to be the first man on the moon. Then I'll talk about Alan Bean a little bit later on. With Neil Armstrong, he was, a, he was from Purdue, he wasn't from UT. He had been a, a Navy fighter pilot in Korea. What happened in Korea? There was a war there in the Navy. They flew off the carriers. He was from NACA test pilot, the National, Aeronau National Aeronautics, I've even forgotten what it means, the National Aeronautics uh, Authority. He was a test pilot for them, and then he, was, he moved over to NASA, became a test pilot. He flew Gemini 8 and the, and the lunar landing vehicle. And then he was a professor at the University of Cincinnati. He was a very shy guy. And then from the rest of his career, he was a consultant. In 1966, Neil was flying in Gemini 8. He and Dave Scott were in this vehicle, and they flew, and they then rendezvoused and docked, the first docking we had ever done. They rendezvoused with this thing, the Agena. Now, what's important here, I don't know if this laser will work very well, but this linear axis, this long axis right here, is very important to what I'm going to say next. They docked with the Agena, and they started spinning about that axis. They started rolling. And what happened was, that, let's see if I can make this thing work. The sequence of events, they docked with the Agena, the roll began, they disconnected from the Agena, and 
Neil thought that what was happening was the, the Agena had a problem. No, the Gemini capsule had a problem, and they started spinning faster. They got to 60 RPM. What is 60 RPM? That's about the low speed of the fan you see on the ceiling. And here you're spinning at 60 RPM sidewise, and these two right here, they would be spinning like this. And uh, he remained conscious and figured out what was going on, shut the system down, and then basically used part of his reentry control, they had double reentry controls, to stop the spinning, and the mission was over. They had to come home the next time they came around to the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean, they landed in the Pacific. Mission had to end. The next thing Neil did, and well, let me show you this picture here first. The thrusters that he thought that one of the thrusters that was stuck was right up here on the back end, and the ones he used to, uh, to control things were these little thrusters down on the front. And that's what he used to control the vehicle to stop the spin. Then the next thing, Neil was out flying, practicing for lunar landing. Several of the astronauts got the chance to practice the lunar landing. What this vehicle does, let me back up one. Can I back that back? Anyway, I, I hit the wrong button. There, there it goes. Uh, this vehicle, the jet engine, there's a jet engine in the middle, and the jet engine supports five-sixths of the weight. The gravity on the moon is one-sixth of that on the Earth. And then he has little rockets around the edge that support one-sixth of the weight of this vehicle. What then happened was that the jet engine went wild and shoved over to one side, and the vehicle went out of control, and Neil waited until he, he was in a right position so that he didn't die when he ejected. He didn't want to eject down into the earth, so he waited till the right time to eject, and obviously he landed, um, he ejected, landed, and you see the, in the lower, uh, your lower right, you see the parachute there. The wind was actually blowing from, from left to right, he landed beyond the fire. He didn't land in the fire. So, uh, but Neil was basically two two times he had done exactly what he should do. And so, what did NASA do? They treated him as half like the insurance policy. He was NASA's insurance policy. And when they landed on the moon, all did not go the way they were supposed to do. Had they landed long, he almost ran out of fuel and they had 15 seconds of fuel left hovering over the surface of the moon, and they, the guys on the ground were saying, abort, abort, and he comes back and says, the eagle has landed. Tranquility base here, the eagle has landed. Now, this is Neil. Let's talk about another person. Let's talk about Al, May, Al Bean, the first Longhorn on the moon. Al was a student here in our aerospace engineering department, graduated in 1955. It was not the aerospace engineering department at that time, it was aeronautical engineering. Aeronautical engineering because we didn't have space then. When did Sputnik go up? Anybody know? 1957. So it was the aeronautical engineering department at that time. He was a Navy pilot from 56 to 63. He then flew, went to the Navy test pilot school and became an astronaut in 1963, and he flew on Apollo 12. Now, Apollo 12 was a very interesting mission also, because on Apollo 12, they had a little event on, on takeoff. The vehicle was struck by lightning. And what happened was that every warning light inside that vehicle turned red. And he and Pete Conrad started pushing resets and lo and behold, before it was very long, the resets were always set, and they said, you're go for, go for the moon. So they did, they were able to save the mission by just doing what they had been trained to do. He flew on Apollo 12, they stayed 31 hours on the moon, then he flew in Skylab. Skylab was our first space station, it was, a, it was an Apollo, uh, second stage that they re reworked. And then, for the last 
37 years of his life, he became an artist. Any, art, any artists in here? Any art people, art students here? I can't see you, so you raise your hand and you don't know. I see you. I saw one of you. Anyway, anyway, he became an artist. And he painted things that no one else could paint. He painted scenes that he had seen of astronauts on the moon. And the, the other thing he did, he brought back a bag full of lunar dust and put lunar dust into every one of his paintings. There's a little bit of lunar dust in every one of his paintings. Now, Albin, then he died a few years ago, but I had the privilege of meeting him at a, at a meeting over here on campus. He came back to campus and I had, got the privilege of meeting him. He was a, a very nice and very gentle man. And then I told you I would see Surveyor. When he and P. Conrad landed on the moon, on Apollo 12, the second lunar landing in 1969, within that decade, of course they had, the decade really ended in, in uh, uh, 1970, but what happened in 1970? Apollo 13, and we all know what happened with Apollo 13. They did land on the moon, and the next land, lunar landing was in 1971. So only this one, they, but on, on, when Bean landed on uh, the lunar, the lunar lander, by the way, is in the background back there. They landed near Surveyor. This is one of the surveyors. And obviously, it did not sink 50 feet into the dust. And I think we get black, fade to black. Thank you. Next up is Dr. Caitlin Casey. We are so lucky to have her at UT. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Astronomy in the College of Natural Sciences. She is going to win so many fantastic awards. She's already won national awards, like the Control Scholars Award, which is one of the most prestigious awards for any, anyone in the physical sciences. And today, she's going to tell us about astronomy. So how are you all doing tonight? Yeah? It's such an honor to be here to welcome you to UT. I hope over the course of the next few years, you uh, really find, uh, discover your passion and take it out into the world. As Dean Iverson says, my passion is astronomy. I'm an astronomer here um, working at, uh, in the department and also McDonald Observatory. Um, and what that means is uh, every day, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky because I get to stare at some of the most distant galaxies in the universe whose light has been traveling across the cosmos for 10, 11, 12 billion years. Now, that might seem pretty far out, uh, because it is, um, but one thing I really love about astronomy and what drew me to it in the first place when I was sitting, you know, in your position was how detached this field, the science is from human intuition. You can't, um, the brain doesn't really do well with the time scales and the physical scales that we're looking at in astronomy, um, billions of years, for example, or millions and billions and billions of miles. If you were keeping track there, that's one with 24 zeros after it. Big distances. Um, but astronomy is an amazing science and a very unique science. For example, we're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing. I wasn't around to, to, to see it happen. I wish I could have been. Um, but to put it in perspective, only 12 people ever have ever set foot on any other astronomical body in the entire universe. And that's the moon. Um, and that's out of 108 billion people who have ever lived. That statistic is really 
um, humbling that, that there have really only been 12 people. But it also highlights that uh, what we learn about our universe is not limited to what we um, learned on our voyage to the moon, uh, multiple voyages to the moon. We learn so much from, from here on Earth looking up. So uh, this is a gorgeous image actually taken out in West Texas. Do we have any folks from West Texas? <laughs> is that right? Yeah, good. So if you're not from West Texas, I'm going to assign a little homework for you. At some point over the next four years, I want you to um, schedule some time, take the drive out to West Texas. We'd love to welcome you at McDonald Observatory in the Davis Mountains. And, and just appreciate the night sky for what it is and how our ancestors viewed this gorgeous um, display of light. Light is, of course, our primary tool in astronomy. It's a bit of a different science in that um, we can't conduct experiments in the classic sense that you think about scientific experiments. We can't grab a star or a galaxy or a planet, smash it against the wall, figure out what, what's inside of it, or um, you know, wait 10 billion years to see what happens. We simply conduct the science by looking up at the sky and trying to piece together the puzzle. Astronomy, in many ways, is the oldest science uh, that has um, been around in human history. There um, are artifacts dating back thousands of years with maps of the night sky um, depicting the, the phases of the moon, uh, specific clusters of stars on the sky, observations of comets like Halley's Comet. Of course, the night sky was essential to our understanding of navigating, uh, navigating across the seas. And, of course, for astronomical um, precise calendar keeping, to know exactly when we are, as well, as well as where we are. But modern astronomy, as we often think of it, um, began just a few hundred years ago um, with uh, Galileo's telescope. So Galileo had the ingenious idea of co-opting you know, the recently uh, invented telescope and pointing it to the sky. And with that simple gesture, he was able to see remarkable detail on the surface of the moon, sketching craters and, and discovering that Jupiter, a planet in our solar system, had moons of its own. A couple, well, about 100 years later, we're starting to see the construction of megalithic telescopes for use um, and so here is William Herschel's telescope, which was used to discover uh, Uranus. And then within 100 years, we had also nailed down Neptune, the, the most distant planet known in our solar system. Um, this is Yerkes Observatory, one of the last um, old school type telescopes where you could actually stare all the way through multiple panes of glass um, at astronomical objects. But the more recent generation of telescopes is quite different. It is based on um, structures of mirrors nested within one another. This is Edwin Hubble. You may have heard his name before. Um, here he is. He's actually nested in the top of the telescope, dangled high above the main uh, light collector down at the bottom of the screen. And what he's doing is installing a photometric plate, a glass plate in the era before digital cameras to observe uh, the brightness of different objects um, on the sky. And you might recognize his name, of course, because of this, um, this remarkable tool we have, the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, it was launched in 1990, which is, I realize, older than most folks in the room today. Um, but it actually is a much older mission than even that. Hubble Space Telescope was dreamt of in the Apollo era, in the 50s, in the 60s, um, that it was really a wild dream to take the complicated mechanics of uh, our eyes to the universe and launch it into space. 
Hubble Space Telescope is approximately the size of a school bus to give you um, an idea of scale. If any of you have been to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., they have a full-scale model of HST as well as some of the old cameras that have been um, traded out. And it still operates today. I plan to use it in the next year. Hubble has delivered some of the most iconic images of science um, and beautiful images that we have to look at. This is the pillars of creation. What it marks is an area um, rich in star formation. So enshrouded in these pillars of dust and gas are newly born stars that soon, over the course of a million years, will push out all of the material and shine brightly, um, exposing their new light for maybe tens of billions of years. The Carina Nebula is quite similar, another iconic image from Hubble. And from stellar birth, we can go to stellar death. Um, it's hard to believe that these images are real. Um, and so I love sharing them with, with uh, folks in my class. So these all mark the death throes of stars when they're running out of fuel, the hydrogen that they burn and turn into helium um, in their cores. And as they run out of fuel, they gravitationally collapse under the massive weight of the stellar material. And the outer layers, which have puffed up, are jettisoned out into interstellar space, polluting the galaxy with metals and dust that then, in turn, turn into planetary systems and new stars uh, like our own planetary system. This is where we came from, and this is also where we're going. My favorite image from Hubble has to be this one, though, because I study galaxies in the distant universe. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Now, uh, just to give you a scale of what you're looking at, this image is approximately the size of a head of a pin held at arm's length on the sky. It's a very small region. And Hubble purposefully um, pointed at a region of the sky that was very, very dark. No known stars or galaxies were in this region. And the purpose was to see what was there. If we stared at one patch of sky, maybe we would see something interesting. And we did. Uh, you can see the, the, the few objects that have little crosses in them. Those are stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. And absolutely everything else in this image is a galaxy outside of the Milky Way containing billions of stars. Um, some of them are relatively nearby, only a couple billion light years away. And, and the most distant objects that we find are those tiny little specks of light in the background that have been um, sending their light across the cosmos for the entire age of the universe. And that's what I get to study every day. Images like these teach us more about the universe we live in. It's taught us that not only is the universe expanding, so in other words, the space between galaxies is actually growing with time, uh, but that the rate of expansion is accelerating with time. This seems really counterintuitive, and most scientists over the past, you know, 50 years would have, you know, disagreed that that's, uh, that's the logical answer. But we're left with this picture. This is where we are right now in terms of the history of our universe. What's depicted on the y-axis is time, the progression of time. And uh, the width of this depiction is the size of the universe with time. So we see the Big Bang happen almost 14 billion years ago. And the universe expands very suddenly. Stars start to form out of the primordial gas from, from the Big Bang, which is mostly just hydrogen and a little bit, bit of helium. And then galaxies form complex structures. We're left at the present day. And what we think will happen in the future is that the universe will keep expanding, and it will 
almost rip itself apart um, at a, a very distant time in the future, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope is not the only space telescope that we have. Um, there's a rich array of telescopes that we have um, sent up into space, as well as, of course, the telescopes we have on the ground. We study different types of light, ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray, infrared, um, and they teach us all sorts of different things about the universe. For example, when I was seated um, in your position, when I started my undergraduate degree, uh, we knew of the eight planets in our solar system, albeit Pluto was a planet then, but no longer, um, and maybe a handful of other candidate planets. We now know of over 4,000 real planets orbiting stars um, in our own Milky Way. And these range in size from larger than Jupiter to smaller than Mercury. Uh, and there's a huge range of planets in between that we just don't have in our own solar system, between the size of Earth and Neptune. In addition to learning about uh, what's further afield, uh, there have been a number of missions over the past 50 years to get to know our own neighborhood a little bit better in our own solar system. The Juno mission to Jupiter took these, this amazing photo, it's really a gorgeous um, photo, that depicts the polar region. So uh, at the bottom of the screen, that's, that's inaccessible from any telescope that's located on Earth. Juno is orbiting Jupiter to understand precisely how dense it is from the center to the outskirts, and it does this by orbiting Jupiter many, many times. And of course, we have now images of Pluto, real images of Pluto. Um, this was taken by the New Horizons mission as it flew by Pluto in uh, 2015. It took nine years to get there. And just to put it in perspective, four years ago before New Horizons, this was the best image we had of Pluto to date from Hubble Space Telescope. It's now a real world. There are other interesting bodies in our solar system that now have stunning images, like this comet and this trans-Neptunian object. They're located in dramatically different parts of the solar system, and yet they seem to have similar shapes like we call this the rubber ducky shape. It's a technical term. Okay, to conclude, I wanted to share with you um, this profound image. And I'm not sure uh, very many of you have seen it before, but it was taken by the Voyager spacecraft, um, which is now the most distant man-made object from uh, planet Earth. Uh, it's left the solar system but on its way out of the solar system, it took this image. It, it turned around and pointed itself to the inner solar system. And uh, this is a pretty profoundly special image because this little dot, this pale blue dot, is our planet Earth. Absolutely everyone you know, the history of the world, exists in that tiny little speck of light. This is something that uh, was very profound to astronomer Carl Sagan. It, the photo was actually taken um, it, because of his uh, inspiration. Um, and he wrote a book called Pale Blue Dot about our place in the cosmos. And so I just want to share with you a snippet, him reading an excerpt from his own book with you uh, to close out today. and foragers. The frontier was everywhere. We were bounded only by the earth and the ocean and the sky. The open road was still soft and calls. Our little terracious globe is the mass of those hundred thousand millions of worlds. We even can read and put our own territory in the water, and we can run our and hatreds 
are we willing to venture out into space? By the time we were going to set you in the nearest other planetary systems, we will have changed. The simple passage of so many generations will have changed us. Necessity will have changed us. We are an adaptable species. It will not be me who much offers and tells me and the other way I start. It will be a species very like us, but with more of our strengths and fewer of our weaknesses. More confident, far seeing, capable, and prudent. For all our failures, despite our limitations and fallibilities, we humans are capable of greatness. Not many years undreamt of in our time will be unwrought in another generation, and none. How far will our nomadic species have wandered by the end of the next century? Our remote descendants safely live in many worlds through the solar system and beyond will be unified by their common heritage, by their regard for their home planet, and by the knowledge that whatever other life may be, all the humans and all the universe come from Earth. They will gaze up and strain to find the blue dot. In their skies. They did one and how vulnerable the repository of all our potential once was. How perilous our infancy. How humble our beings. How many rivers we had to cross before we found our way. Thank you. Well, after we're done with the presentations, we're actually going to be taking questions from you. So if you take out your phones and you're interested and you want to tweet a question, you can tweet it to hashtag UTULS2019. UTULS2019. Next up, we have Moriba Ja. He's the Associate Professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics in the Cockrell School of Engineering. As well as, oh, actually, come on, you can do better than that. Cockrell School of Engineering. As well as the Director for Computational Astronautical Sciences and Technologies in the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at UT. Thank you, thank you. How's everybody doing? Good? Awesome? All right. So, um, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very much a pleasure to be here with you. And I'm relatively new to UT. I've only been here a couple of years. But uh, I've been doing the, the job I'm going to talk to you about uh, for quite some time. Raleigh first talked to you about the moon and, and, and sending people there and you know, the fascinating space exploration, especially you know, 50 years after uh, that first moment when, when, when humanity was able to go to another uh, celestial body. Caitlin then went way beyond the moon to things like the Big Bang and, 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 and you know, so many you know, millions of light years. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about a problem that could threaten space exploration itself and some of the assets that have taken some of the most awesome pictures that we have of our universe. So I'm going to talk to you about satellites. My background is in uh, astrodynamics, which is the science that studies motion of objects in space. And in fact, it started with astronomers way back in the day. I, I guess people here, hopefully you've heard of, of, of Copernicus and Galileo Galilei. Hopefully you've heard of people like Tycho Brahe and uh, Johannes Kepler, and if you haven't, then you can take my class and hear more about these things. But, uh, very, very cool work. And, you know, 1950, so, so Sputnik went up in 57. 
Back then, we had no idea how near Earth space would turn out. So satellites, so so what? Ah, satellites, who cares? Well, so you've seen some of the cool pictures so far about satellites, but there are some services and some capabilities that these things provide that we couldn't get in other ways. One of the things that I teach is I teach the satellite-based navigation class uh, you know, every fall, and I explain this global navigation satellite system to people, and back in the day, trying to navigate from one place to the other was extremely difficult. Um, does anybody in this room have the experience of having to take a map and fold it out to figure out, okay, we got one, we got, really, come on, come on, all right. Okay, good. I'm glad that some of you have that experience because if this technology went away, it would be a bad day for many people, okay? Bad day for many people. And so these services, not, you know, not only do they put, you know, provide position navigation and timing for maritime, for air domain, even for things on the ground, but they also provide timing for many, many other things that we'll talk about here, okay? This is a picture that I got that really makes no sense, but seemed kind of interesting. Um, apparently somebody with a cell phone that's like something like showering things from the middle of, of the ocean to different places doesn't make much sense. But the takeaway is this, is that satellite technology is also providing people with knowledge of where things are located that they're interested in, such as like fleets of ships, trucks. I know, I know people that keep track of their fleets with this position navigation and timing. So it's a critical service, critical capability. What are some other things? Well, obvious ones, right? We have weather, we have hurricanes. If anybody here is, uh, you know, has, has lived for any amount of time on the Atlantic uh, shores of the United States, especially in the South, you're probably very familiar with this sort of stuff. Let me just say this. When these type of natural phenomena uh, have exchanges with human dwellings, it's not a very good outcome, okay? Human dwellings and hurricanes don't mix well, especially when there are humans inside. So it's really nice when we can get some sort of prediction, you know, some warning, you know, a lot of, a lot of warning when you should relocate or get out of the way. If it's just based on line of sight for a human on the surface of the Earth, then that warning is maybe minutes, hours, line of sight from something that is space-based, that extends it quite a bit. Disaster relief, floods, and how to mobilize people, you know, how to deal with different fires and, and information related to uh, where the fire may be going as a function of time. Education. Right now we have several companies that want to provide global internet. Global internet, launching thousands of satellites to get internet everywhere on the planet so that people can get educated everywhere. That there's no kind of stone left unturned in terms of being able to get people knowledge. One of the things that I want to tell you um, that made a very big difference in my career, in my life, was you know in school at some point, taking classes in physics and that sort of thing, I never imagined that somebody like me could, without the aid of somebody else, make observations of the world around me and figure it out. I never thought that possible. And that knowledge of how things work and being able to predict an outcome and actually see laws of nature unfold before me and understand how that happened, that made a difference because that was something that I had that nobody could take from me. It made a big difference in my life. Everybody, everybody on the planet should be able to have that. And so satellite technology is going to provide that. But there are some caveats. Banking. Ah, maybe you didn't know about that. You know, you might go to some, some place in Italy, go to Lake Como, go to an ATM, try to get some money. You may not be able to get your cash out. That's a bad day, let me tell you. That's not so good, okay? Even agriculture knowing where we should be planting certain seeds that have the best opportunity to grow and, and, and all these things. All that is satellite technology. So what if, what if 
every working satellite disappeared. Bum, 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 bum. Yowza, okay? So, no more position navigation and timing. Oh, by the way, the banking stuff, the, the, the transactions are timed with GPS, okay? When the transactions happen, that, that goes away. You can forget about the weather warnings. You can forget, you can definitely forget about pretty pictures about galaxies and stuff. I'm not gonna do that. You lose, yes, that doesn't make Caitlin too happy. You lose a lot of that stuff, okay? Is it possible for every single satellite to disappear instantly? No, but several of them have, and that will continue to happen. So what's up in orbit? What is this stuff that I'm talking about? Where does it come from? Right now, the US government has the largest database of human-made objects orbiting the Earth. And that's about 26,000 things ranging in size from this kind of cell phone size thing all the way up to the space station, school bus size space station. 26,000 things, okay? Orbiting the Earth, different orbits. And every once in a while, two of these things will collide with each other, or one of these things will explode, or even worse, Somebody may blow up their own satellite in space as some demonstration of who knows what. And each one of those events creates many, many more pieces. And most of that stuff never comes back. People think, oh, you put something in orbit and just leave it alone, eventually it'll come back and burn up in the atmosphere. No. If it's sufficiently above the sensible atmosphere, it's going to be up there for a very, very long time. So we have these highways in space where we put things because it's not just kind of really, really kind of randomly scattered. No, certain objects we put into certain orbits because we don't like fighting Mother Nature. We like taking advantage of this thing called gravitational influence, okay? So there's these highways. Curvature of space-time gives us these nice highways in space. The highways are becoming more crowded because again, a lot of the stuff is not kind of off-ramping off these highways. But there are no traffic rules in space. Okay? There's no, ah, I see Jimmy's coming my way, I'm just gonna, we're, all, we're both just gonna turn left. There's none of that, okay? There's none of that going on. That's very unfortunate. There's no common sharing of information about stuff in space, okay? There's no global sharing, there's no agreement on what's up there, where it's at, believe it or not. There's a lot of squ secret squirrel kind of stuff, people kind of hoarding their own data, but there's no global information system for space traffic. So what we want is we want for space to be secure, safe, and sustainable, and we want to do that by making all of space transparent and predictable. So we want to know what an object will do, how will an object in space behave, cultural competency is a key. Really? So out of the 26,000 objects that I told you about, only about 2,000 of those objects work. Everything else was garbage, okay? About 2,000 or so satellites. These are controlled by people. So, if you want to know what American culture looks like in space, I can tell you that American satellites only maneuver on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. You don't do it on a Friday because Murphy's Law, something bad happens, you can't go home, you gotta stay at work. Certainly don't want to do maneuvers on weekends and holidays, that's crazy. That's foolish. And you don't want to do it on a Monday when you come back to work. So Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. That's how American culture manifests itself in space. Even when you have a set of guidelines that people agree to, they won't apply them in the same way. What is the Sharia interpretation of long-term sustainability guidelines? Do Jewish people maneuver their satellites on Shabbat? I don't know. But what I'm saying is that these are some of the questions that we need to ask. Because if we need to be safe, we need to be able to predict what any given entity is going to do for a given situation. So what if we had this global and independent way to monitor space, not let any single entity dominate the opinions about stuff in space? I present to you astrograph. Ah, ah. No, I'm just joking. I just, you know, my kids watch uh, Sesame Street. They like the count, so I had to do that. So anyway, 
So there's this thing called astrograph, and this was developed here at UT by us, okay? Now, what you see here is most of these 26,000 objects, we have multiple opinions that we can crowdsource and bring this together in a common framework to show people, give them an idea of the distribution of all that stuff. Every single dot, which is not to scale, by the way, every single dot is something that a human is responsible for putting there, okay? Now, how varied are these opinions, you might ask? Well, if you only had the information from the US Department of Defense, this would be your ways for space. This is your space traffic map. This is what you, this is what you would believe. But what if you ask the Russians? Sorry, that don't look the same. <laughs> That's an issue. Who's right? Who's wrong? What should you trust? Who do you believe? There's an inconsistency that we still have not been able to reconcile with what's up there, and where is it going to go, and who, who, does it, who does it belong to? Who's responsible? So what are we doing here at UT? We're developing the Hogwarts. I told you I had kids. We're developing the Hogwarts of space, right? The cool thing is, so we have aerospace engineering, we have astronomy, uh, we're developing a space kind of law curriculum on campus so we can get people involved in policy and that sort of stuff. So we're trying to bring all this together so that the next person who is a congressman, okay, that comes to the, the UT halls, much like yourselves, that person knows what a telescope looks like. And, you know, the next astronomer, you know, knows what, wow, it's really hard to come to consensus to agree on giving guidelines. So we can all get our degrees, but we all need each other in the dark arts class. Yeah? That's what we want, okay? Who cares about this stuff? I am plugged in in ways that you would never imagine. I've testified to Congress about this stuff. I've met several congressmen and representatives, Marvin Excelio there. I've met the NASA administrator to talk about these things. I've talked to major generals in the Pentagon about this stuff, the FAA. Okay? And I've been on several panels, and uh, I can tell you, it's just not enough. I need, I, need, I need more. I need more to happen. It's just, it's not enough. And so what I'm asking you, I'm actually begging all of you to consider being a part of this effort, because we might actually lose the ability to use space for humanity's benefit. Thank you. You know, I have to tell you what an honor it is to be on the stage with the three of you. That, that was phenomenal. And I hope you've understood a little bit about what's really possible and think about what we can do. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask just a few questions. Um, well, I'm going to start with you. Why haven't we been back to the moon? Is it a political reason? An engineering problem? Or have we gathered enough information already? It's politics. Just plain and simple as plain politics. Plain and simple politics and money. I don't want this. Uh, yes, yeah, Kaylin, what is the range of the most powerful telescope on Earth, and how can we think about how far it can see? That's a great question. Uh, we have a suite of telescopes here on Earth um, that operate in all sorts of different ways. Some of the most groundbreaking ones that are on the ground right now. Um, well, of course, I have to mention the one we have out in West Texas, the Hobby Eberly Telescope, um, which is conducting a really cool new survey uh, to figure out what dark energy is. But there are also a suite of major telescopes in Hawaii and in Chile. Those are some of the best sites in the world for astronomy. And we can see the very first galaxies with those telescopes, just like the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble is really good at finding them, and then we often will try to, um, you know, use these other telescopes like Keck or Alma, operating at different, you know, energies of light to learn as much about those galaxies as possible. But they're really hard to find, and we're, we're working on new ways of finding these most distant relics 
And just to give you an idea of when they existed, um, the light from these distant sources has been traveling over 13 billion years to reach us. And the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. So, um, but, you know, we should feel very special that we get to collect some of the light from, from those sources. Wow. Dr. Zha, is there research to create space objects that intentionally come back to Earth rather than stay there and cause potential problems with collisions? So could you ask the question again, please? So is, is there research being done to create uh, satellites and other space objects that intentionally come back on yeah, 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 absolutely. Is, so, instead of just staying there? Yeah, so, so um, one of the things that people are uh, definitely encouraging is that just like when you go camping, you, you, you go, you have a good time, but you bring back the stuff that you took with you, you don't just leave it on the campsite. People are trying to invest in technologies for, for the sort of uh, debris remediation. So try to prevent that these things stay on orbit, return them in a certain amount of years. Maybe there are ways that the, that the thing can deorbit itself, make itself larger so that using things like you know, non-gravitational accelerations, it basically bleeds energy out of the orbit and can burn up in the atmosphere and that sort of thing. So absolutely. Okay, and this is the last question. I'm gonna get, throw it out to all of you. Um, and I'd like to hear an answer from all of you from your own perspectives. What is the coolest thing that has to do with space that they're going to see in their lifetimes? The coolest thing. Okay, so here it is. Uh, I think one of the coolest things that you're going to see in your lifetime regarding space is going to be a reality TV show. It's going to be a reality TV show where you can actually apply and the winner of the reality TV show actually is going to get to go to space. I think that will happen in your lifetime. <laughs> Is it the bar low? I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Don't be depressed. <laughs> You're gonna go to Mars. That's what's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> that can be on the space place? Yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Wait. Okay. Okay. Great question. Okay. Um, so what I would say um, is that I think, you know, within your lifetimes, one of the most exciting things we can find in space is uh, a biosignature. That's the possibility that we might um, detect life elsewhere in the universe. Right now, we only have a single data point, and that's the Earth. We know life exists here, and it exists in many forms, but we don't yet know of a single life form uh, beyond the Earth. And it's um, not for lack of trying to find it, um, we're now in the planning stages of the next generation of major telescopes that will be able to look for biosignatures. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launched next year. Yeah, we can't wait. I've been waiting for forever, I feel. Um, and, and that will allow us to peer into the atmospheres of giant planets. But what we really need is something that would be able to detect um, a signature of life on a terrestrial-like planet, and we have to build much larger telescopes for that. And right now, we're in the planning stages of it, and I believe someone out there will use it to, to find the first biosignature. Dr. Well, actually, I think I was going to say something like what Kaylin said, but I, was, I think we will find life in our solar system in one of the one of the ice giant, or the ice planets, the ice moons of Jupiter, or fingers crossed. fingers crossed for that. But I think that's, I think we will find that. We'll find a signature of life there, on either Enceladus or uh, probably Enceladus. Probably Enceladus. Enceladus is yeah. probably, yeah. I bet on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm betting on that too. But you'll find that. You I should think. bet on. That. I'm going to bet on the, that reality TV show. <laughs> I want to go to space. <laughs> I wish I was all young enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, thank you again. This has been fantastic. <laughs> and if you have any further questions, they're going to be up in the front of the stage. Feel free. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you.